I always like doing this because I come in after somebody that's just talked about accelerators for really high performance, really great data bandwidth and stuff, and that is all very impressive. But we use accelerators for an entirely different purpose to make things much lower power and, and smaller. So I'm going to talk about AI at the edge. I think the speaker after me is going to talk about roughly the same thing. I'm going to talk about using FPGA or EFPGA to, to help with that. We know that today one of the big paradigms is, of course, using AI um, for multiple reasons why you would want to use AI for various things. But if you look at a typical case of a dumb sensor, which is what you had in the past, all the red dots represent data you might be taking. You're, you're taking a measurement. Um, let's say I'm walking along and my wristwatch here is, is checking my accelerometer. It's taking lots of pieces of data. And every time I take a step, you get a meaningful event. That's the little piece of green in there. So what most people do today with the cloud is they ship all of this data back to the cloud. So you're spending a lot of energy on moving the data around, you're using a lot of bandwidth to move the data around, so you prefer just to move the meaningful events around. So the way you do that is you want to deploy some algorithm out at the endpoint that's going to sort through all of that data and tell you what the meaningful events are. Well, it turns out that's relatively easy if you want to do something like step counting, but the minute you want to do something like activity detection, it gets quite difficult. And People are not very good about generating the right algorithms for these things. So if you want to distinguish between someone riding in a bus and riding in a car, it actually turns out to be a lot easier to use AI application to do that. And you want to deploy some AI out into the endpoint. So that kind of motivates why you'd want AI out in the endpoint. It's going to reduce the amount of data, send back meaningful information, and maybe take action right out at the endpoint, reducing your latency. And then, of course, there's some privacy issues, too, right? You don't really want your Amazon Echo sending everything up to Amazon. You'd prefer to be looking for the keyword and then send stuff off to the keyword up. So the kind of devices that concern me are the resource-constrained devices. And um, just to give you an idea about that, we see people who want to use two AA cells to run some sensor for maybe two years kind of thing. And when you talk about that, you're down in maybe the 100 microamps or 100 microwatt kind of power. So the, pushing the power budget down there is quite a challenge. And you can see that there's expected to be a lot of growth in this area because people talk about, OK, we're going to do 50 billion sensors. Well, those are not going to be $10 sensors or $20 sensors. They're going to be down in the dollar kind of range. And that means you have a, a, a big constraint on the amount of area, the amount of resources you can afford to put in that. And you have to hit your power budget. So now you've got to have low cost devices and low energy consumption. How are you going to do both of those things? Dealing with these severe resource constraints. So one thing is moving this data from raw sensor data down to meaningful events. You do not want to be trying to ship a lot of stuff over Wi-Fi or even BLE. So again, we talk about using AI to reduce the data down to meaningful data and then shipping only the meaningful data. And then the other thing is using hardware processing engines to deliver energy efficiency. So you can be pretty sure these devices are not going to be just CPUs. They're going to have specialized hardware accelerators in there. And these hardware accelerators, in our experience, give you maybe 3 to 10x more energy efficiency. So you're going to need to sprinkle them around. And then you're also going to want to use hardware processing engines to augment CPU performance. Because this small CPU you're going to put in there for cost and area and power reasons won't be able to hit some of the peak performance loads that you might want to have. So you can use these accelerators to accelerate. That's the third case, or to reduce power, which is the second case. So we, we wanted to look at how you would do that in deploying EFPGA in it. So we, we built some parts that have uh, ARM cores in them and use EFPGA. We do this acceleration. And what we find works very well for power management is use um, hardware to figure out trigger events, and then once you have a trigger event, you might wake up a CPU to do more work. But we knew going forward that we wanted to do more hardware acceleration and more integrated hardware acceleration, and RISC-V seemed like a good way to do that because we can go in the ISA and we can change it to do what we need to do. So we wanted to find a starting point to do this and to test our theories about whether or not FPGA was required in acceleration. And as anybody who's watched the AI world goes, you know there's a huge debate. Do you do AI with 
uh, FPGAs? Do you do it with GPUs or do you do it with something like a, a tensor processing unit? So we wanted to know for ourselves, well, where does FPGA fit into this or does it fit in here? We went and looked around. We found Pulpissimo core. It seemed like a good starting framework that we could use. Um, it's got the 32-bit risk core with ISA extensions. Those extensions uh, increase energy efficiency of signal processing algorithms. And a lot of what we see in sensor processing is standard signal processing algorithms, FIR filters, IIR filters, those kind of things. It has an autonomous I.O. system. So the devices we built also use an autonomous I.O. system. We find that really vital for reducing power in, or increasing energy efficiency, depending on how you want to look at it. Because when you have all of these sensors, um, you're doing the same thing on them over and over again. So my watch right now is monitoring an accelerometer so it can tell how much I'm walking. 50 times a second, it's going out on the I squared C bus and saying, please read these three registers. And you really don't need a CPU to do that. You should do that in hardware. So the uh, micro DMA here will let you do that. Pulpissimo already put that in place. And then we needed support for custom hardware processing elements um, because that's where we think you get the leverage in, in these kind of applications. And of course, Pulpissimo actually contemplated that, so they have their hardware processing element block in there. So we thought, well, this, this would be a good starting point for our experiments. So we went and talked to the guys at um, ETH Zurich, and we said, we think this would be a good thing to do. And they looked at us and said, well, why on earth would you put FPGA in there? I mean, you're trying to build a low power thing. FPGA is higher power than hardware. Um, doesn't make sense to us. And we said, well, here's the issue. If you have a hazy crystal ball, if your marketing guys don't know exactly what the market's going to do, um, and it's a software issue and you get it wrong, there's really no problem. You do an over-the-air update, everybody's happy. But if your hardware crystal ball is hazy and you don't have any FPGA, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to do a workaround in software and you're going to pay a big power penalty. And so we run into that with some of the hearable devices we, we worked on. We didn't recognize that we needed to have certain features. We'd end up deploying a fair amount of signal processing in software, and it just blows the power budget horribly. But if you have an EFPGA, well, now you can build hardware. It's not as good as ASIC gates, but it's a lot better than software. And you can do an over-the-air update to update this FPGA. And that lets you have the flexibility to adapt to future market needs. Now, again, that's probably not an issue if you're building something big like a smartphone because you know where the market's going. But if you're building an IoT kind of device, you're not quite sure what's going to happen in the future. And, you, and that flexibility may be useful to you. So working with ETH Zurich, taking Pulpissimo and the EFPGA, we decided we'd build this test bed so we could try out these theories. So ETH supplies Pulpissimo. We supply the EFPGA. We're using Global Foundry's 22FDX process because that gives us very nice low power performance. And the goal of this thing is to demonstrate you know, tightly coupled hardware processing elements based in FPGA and see how they, could be, how they could be used. We have great appreciation for the guys at ETH. They really worked hard and did all of the layout and stuff for this, gave us this wonderful logo on top of our chip. And uh, actually, we're hitting tape out, I think, in the next couple of days. So what are the three use cases uh, for EFPGA? Actually, I think there's a fourth, but the three I'm going to talk about today is there's a coprocessor use case. So you have a hardware processing element implemented in EFPGA to offload the risky CPU. I think this is going to be kind of a rarer case than the other ones, because there's plenty of hardware processing elements you can build today. You can buy them from Siva or other people, so there's really it's hard to imagine a miss here. Um, there's also a preprocessor use case. Um, here where the hardware processing element is inserted between the sensors and the, and the risky CPU. So you're taking data in from the sensors and you're doing some kind of manipulation on it before you feed it to the, to the CPU or other accelerators in the system. And this is what Jonathan Rose calls bump in the wire processing. It's stream processing. And actually, we, we have been seeing it quite a lot. I'll talk about that more. And then the final case is sensor actuator or accelerator interface use case. So here, the EFPGA maybe directly interfaces with some new sensor or some actuator or some other accelerator device which has non-standard interface requirements. 
So let's look at the, the kind of format for this. So the coprocessor use case, most people are used to this. Um, you have your CPU, you set up data in the memory, you hand it off, and then you use the memory interface to bring it into the EFPGA, maybe run it through some math blocks that you have attached to the EFPGA, and then you push the results back into the main memory. The reason why this gives you a power advantage is that the state machines and the data pods don't burn a lot of power reading instructions out of memory. So anytime you use hardware, you'll get significantly lower power than using a CPU to do the same job just because of the instruction fetches. So typically, if you look at a processor, you'll see uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of the power is based in the instruction fetches. And RISC has this property that you load stuff into registers and you push it back out into memories. You can avoid all of that when you do a hardware implementation. Whenever I bring this up with people, they always go, yeah, but EFPGA is higher power than ASIC gates. Why would you use EFPGA? I go, wrong comparison. It's lower power than software. Yes, it's more than hardware, but it's lower power than software. And the kind of things that we have seen people put in here are things like FFTs, MFCCs, uh, discrete wavelet transforms. And you can actually put some neural network stuff in here. The vector blocks guys put binary neural networks in there with lattice, those kind of things. Not a huge fan of doing all of those things because I think other hardware accelerators will do that better. OK, the preprocessor use case. So in this case, you're reading from the sensor, you bring it into the EFPGA, you do some processing on it, push it back into the memory, and then you go off and do the other processing. So here you're using the micro DMA to manage the sensors, using again the state machines and data parts in the EFPGA to process the data, um, using the memory in the connect to do that. Same issue, lower power than software, higher than dedicated hardware. The same kind of things, you'll see FFTs, MFCCs, DWTs, but now when you move into image processing, you see some other things like region of interest selection. Well, that's not something that's so easy to do in your typical Mac-based uh, machine. You'll see subsampling. You'll see histogramming. You'll see reshaping of regions, all of these kind of things attached to image sensors, which are non-conventional processing and maybe don't, they're actually better done in hardware than they are done in software, even a DSP kind of software. And then you have the, what I call the sensor, sensor actuator accelerator use case, where in this case, um, you're taking data perhaps from the RISC CPU, processing it, and then pushing it out to an actuator. So why might that come about? Well, there's lots of actuators that don't follow standard interfaces like SPI or I squared C or so on. They may have fairly critical timing um, to do something, and then you need hardware assist to get that critical timing. EFPGA is a nice way of doing that. You may want to attach your IoT chip to some non-standard peripheral like a laser scanner or an image sensor. And again, those have pretty discrete timing requirements. There's uh, specialized hardware to handle them. EFPGA is a good way to implement that without having to spin your chip. You know, dumb things like multicolor LEDs have very strange uh, things. And what we're finding right now is there's a lot of um, neural network chips out there, coming back to the AI argument. Um, so we, we run into people who built this nice neural network chip to do a CNN or an RNN or what have you. And they have a small problem. It doesn't integrate to their sensor. So they need pre-processing to get the data in and reformatted for their sensor. So think of a very simple case with, a, with an image processing system. What comes out of your sensor? RGB, RGB. What do you typically have in an AI? A whole plane of R, a whole plane of G, a whole plane of B. So you need to do that kind of transformation. Yeah, that'll settle out in the future, and people will build the right interfaces to do that. But there's a transition period here where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the interface is going to look like. I think uh, in the future, um, so we'll use this to test it. And right now, we'll use the RISC CPU itself as, as, as the processing engine. But I see more the future is lying with having hardware processing elements along with the RISC CPU and the EFPGA. And the EFPGA doing all the things I talked about, except now it's taking maybe data from a sensor, pre-processing it, pushing it into the hardware processing engine that might be a CNN kind of engine, that kind of thing. And then when meaningful events come out, then you go over to the RISC kind of CPU in order to, to act on those events. What I believe here, and I kind of show this in the diagram in the lower left, is that 
using EFPGA in there gives you the full flexibility space. So you have hardware processing engines. When you know what you need to do, build them in in hardware. It is the best way to do it. The trouble is that's all done pre-manufacturing. And once you manufactured the thing, you don't get to change it. If you have EFPGA in there, now you get some hardware flexibility. It's not as energy efficient as the full hardware, but it's more energy efficient than software, and you can deploy that as a, in a post-manufacturing environment. So we're looking forward to getting this test chip back in maybe a quarter or so. Um, we're going to be doing experiments on it, publishing papers, letting you know what it does, and I think ETH Zurich also has plans to do experiments on, push around on it, publish results, so we can all see whether or not this actually makes sense in this environment. I believe it will, but data will tell us. Um, there is one other form of acceleration I didn't talk about, which is one of the things that pushes us into the risk five, and that is um, instruction acceleration. Uh, you can extend the ISA on the risk five, as, as ETH Zurich did, to add in particular instructions to do things. We didn't try that in this case. The uh, Zurich guys are skeptical of it because the problem you have there is that the EFPGA, by definition, is slower than your hardware logic. So to do, you know, so this, this pulp core is closed at maybe 425 megahertz. The EFPGA probably runs comfortably at 100, so you've got a four to one disparity. So you sort of say, well, that's not a good idea because I'm gonna have to wait for clock cycles, waste for instructions in order to use EFPGA as an accelerator. But again, in my world, there are times when I'm waiting for a trigger and I slow down everything. So I may run my main CPU at 50 megahertz while I'm waiting to figure out whether someone has shown up in front of the camera. When someone shows up in front of the camera, I go, ooh, there's a face in front of the camera. Now I wake up, go to full performance and say, is that Tim in front of the camera? Do I want to turn on my computer or open my door? So in that mode where we're running at maybe 50 megahertz, then I think it is reasonable to use EFPGA as, a, as an instruction extension. That's something, though, that we'll have to do in, in a future experiment. Thank you. I hope this was helpful in a different direction than the, the previous really high performance. And I think you'll hear more about what you can do in these low-power domains in the next speaker.